Okay, very good. Well, we are thankful to be here today. God is good, isn't he? We're, we're, we're going to have a little um, science demonstration first, but I might need an assistant. Is there anyone in the back that would like to help me? Oh, I do have an assistant. Come up, my dear. Jillian's going to come up. She's the first assistant. You're the second one. You can hold off. Okay, come up right over here beside me, honey. And what we have here is just a regular pitcher. We have a pitcher here. And we have some things here. Now, um, I'm going to have to help you just a little bit here. I'm going to put you over here because you'll need to stand up on this. Is that okay? Okay, come on up there. Okay. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to take this and help me pour it into there. Can you pour that in there? All right. Now, that happens to be vinegar. That happens to be vinegar. Now, we also have here some something white. What does that look like? Sugar. It does look a little like sugar, but it's not. This is baking soda. Now, you've heard it said, you know, go big or go home. So we're going to go big here. Now, when you put it in, put it all in at one time. You ready? Okay, now watch out now. And let's just stir it up a little bit here. And see what happens. Maybe we needed more of the other stuff. It didn't bubble up as big as I thought it would. I must have forgotten my cow. Oh, that's right. I needed another half cup of that, and that will help us. Okay, here you go. You want to help me tip that over? There we go. Okay, now that's making nice bubbles, isn't it? Now, what is this, Jillian? It's a candle. It's a candle, isn't it? So we're going to light this candle. I'm going to light this one, too, just in case we need a second candle. might be helpful if I can get it to go. Okay. Now, I'm going to carefully take this and watch the candle. Watch the candle. Watch the candle. Oh, what happened to the candle? It went out. Now, why would the candle go out? Because I didn't pour any of the water on it. What made the candle go out? Well, sort of, but not exactly. Well, <laughs> it, no, that might, well, it might have a little smudge on from that. But what we did, and we'll, we'll get some more, and we'll try to reproduce this again, but we'll try to do it a little better this time. <clears throat> we'll get us some more of this good stuff. And we'll make a, we'll make a lot of, of bubbles this time. That's why we put the tray down. We expected a little bit more. Okay. I could put the big chemical formulas in front of you. Mike probably knows them. But what we're actually doing is we're, we're using the... Uh, the baking soda here with the vinegar, and these bubbles are carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is heavier than oxygen, so it's forcing all the oxygen up out, and the carbon dioxide is setting in here. And so when you take this gently, you can just pour the carbon dioxide out, and it will snuff the candle out. So, okay, you can go back now. You've done great. Thank you so much. So you can't see the carbon dioxide. You can't um, know it's there by your sight, but it, it is there. So there's an unseen force, or we might say there's an invisible force going on there, right? That's right. Now, I have another one. You might have to zoom out just a little bit, but I'm going to ask our strong man, Andy, to come up here for a minute. Because I'm going to prove to you sometimes that the weak are stronger than the strong. And so I have here just this, this little, little piece of metal and this little piece of metal here. And I, I don't know that Andy can lift this little piece of metal. But I'm going to give him a chance. I'm going to let him try, and I'll, I'm going to help him, in fact. So I'm going to take this little piece of metal and just put it down here. And I'll hold this for you, and I want you to pick that piece of metal up. <laughs> Hard to get out. Are there edges on it? Yeah, it's got edges. Yeah, he's made it hard. 
There you go. It was pretty hard to do, wasn't it? He had to cheat. He had to shoot it over against the edge. <laughs> just couldn't pick it up. Look at me. I can just pick it up. See how easy that is? Okay. So we know that's a magnet. Thank you very much, Andy. You can sit down now. And give me just a second. I'll go back over here. Today we're talking about invisible forces. You couldn't see the carbon dioxide that was being poured out of the pitcher just a little bit ago. You can't see the magnetic field around that magnet. And by the way, Andy, that's a neodymium magnet. It's the kind of magnet they put in hard drives or the old kind of hard drives. They're very strong magnets. Uh, you, if, you had a, if you had one this big and you put your hand against a piece of metal and put it up here, it would crush your hand. It would be so strong it would actually crush your hand coming against to the metal. Uh, but these, these help us to understand things like radiation when you go to get an x-ray. Um, this last week I had an issue and I had to have a, a CT scan of my abdomen area. And they're taking a lot of three-dimensional pictures, you know. Um, you don't see the radiation. You don't feel the radiation. But that radiation is very real. And it is, in fact, it's there. Uh, and, and this is sort of like wind. You know, Jesus in John chapter 3 when he was speaking with Nicodemus, in chapter 3 and verse 8, he said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You see, friends, there are very real forces in the physical world that can't be seen. Gravity, among others. There are forces, though, in the spiritual world that cannot be seen. I invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to begin by talking about some of the invisible spiritual things. Colossians chapter 1. And I'm going to start in verse 12. We'll read Colossians 1, 12 through 16. Here Paul says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of Darkness. Let me just stop there for a minute. Can you see darkness? I mean, really, you can't see the darkness, can you? There's just nothing there to see. And who hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And now notice verse 15. Who is the image of what? The invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, that is by Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and what else? Invisible. invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And so there are things that were created visible and some things that were simply invisible. Things that we can perceive, things that we can't perceive. Right now, scientists are trying to figure out this concept of what's called dark matter dark matter. They understand by studying the, the different galaxies and the, and, and the star systems that the, 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 the apparent pull that they have one against another and how they affect each other cannot be accounted for solely by just the gravitation that, that, that mass has. And so they say there has to be something else that's affecting these things. We can't see it, and so we call it dark. There's some kind of matter or mass out there they think is affecting those things. But the Bible speaks about invisible things. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul makes reference to this also. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For the invisible things of him, of him who is the invisible God, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead or divinity, so that they are without excuse. He says that there's things that aren't seen, but we can understand them by the things that are seen. You know, you, you can't understand at first just by looking at the extinguishing of the candle, but when you understand the things that are seen, the things that we have been able to produce and, and study out, we, we understand that better. Uh, just like the magnet, we know there's a magnetic force. We, we can take a, a magnet and we can put it on uh, underneath a piece of paper with iron filings on top of it, and we can see the pattern of the, of the polarity of the magnet, etc. We've all done those experiments probably in school. In 1 Timothy, and in fact, we have a couple of texts from 1 Timothy here, but in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, again, 
Here Paul now speaks about this invisible God. He says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now he calls him the invisible God, but do you think he's invisible to the angels? Is he invisible to Christ? He may be invisible to us now. We may not be able to see him now because as we see in chapter 6 of Timothy in verse 16, it says, Who only hath immortality? dwelling in the light which no man can approach. And so the Father is, is, is in this light. We can't approach Him. We can't see Him because of the light that dwells about Him today. Our sinful nature prevents us from being able to approach Him today. Not until the sweet by and by can we do that in person. We know that there are angels, both good and bad, that work around us that we do not see. Elisha, in his time, asked God to open his servant's eyes when the king of Syria had sent his uh, armies around Dothan to, to take Elisha captive. And uh, he said, open his eyes that he can see. And he said, I, I see chariots of fire. The mountains are full of chariots of fire. And there were angels there all about them. We know that in, in, in the story of the demonics at Gennesaret, that there were unseen demons. In fact, there was a legion of demons there possessing those two men. They couldn't be seen. They couldn't be perceived by human eyes. They were invisible to them, but they were very real, and they were there. And in fact, they caused all the swine to, uh, to go over the cliff. Manuscript Releases, Volume 11, page 103 and 104. We read this. Day by day, the conflict between good and evil is going on. As a people, we do not understand, as we should, the great conflict going on between invisible agencies. Evil angels are constantly at work, planning their line of attack, controlling as commanders, kings, and rulers the disloyal human forces. Maybe some of those angels are appearing as men, or maybe they are influencing those rulers who are men. But there are very real forces. So there, there are these forces, and some are loyal to God, and some are loyal to Satan. How do you fight someone you can't see? You know, if you were in a dark room, and there was someone in there that could see you. Maybe they had infrared vision or maybe they had night vision goggles. There was just enough light that those would activate. And uh, they can see you, but you can't see them. You don't stand much of a chance, hardly, do you? It, it, it seems hard. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul tells us, though, that even though we are fighting against invisible forces, we can't do it in the flesh. We just can't do it in the flesh. He says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now the word that we translate flesh here is from the Greek word sarx. It's from the Greek word sarx. Keep that in mind. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But that word carnal comes, is translated from a word that is a, a, der, a derivation, derivation of sarx. It's from sarx. It's, a, it's basically the same word, just in a different form. So it could be translated flesh. We're in the flesh, but we don't have weapons of the flesh. But instead, he says, but mighty, we have mighty weapons through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And after all, we're not fighting in the flesh, we're not fighting for the flesh, we're fighting for the mind, we're fighting for the control of the spirit. And that's what's important to us, right? And so he says here that, that we are to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So he says we don't have fleshly weapons. But what weapons have been given to the Christians then? Interestingly, invisible weapons. Invisible weapons. That's right. 
In Ephesians, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We read here about the armor of God, but you know it's interesting, the word that we translate armor, it can mean weapons, it can mean weapons, armor, it, it means just all that which the soldier would use. And I'm in Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to start in verses 10 and 11. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, in the, if you can see the slides, you notice that I've got be strong and put some of those verbs in, in a highlighted form because those are emphatics. That they're in an emphatic state, meaning that this is something you've got to do. You've got to be strong in the Lord. The, the expression be strong here means, uh, according to the Greek, to be able to function or to do something. But this is in the Lord. In other words, be strong, be able to function, but how? In the Lord. You're able to function in the Lord. We can't do this in ourselves. And he says, put on the whole armor of God. The word armor is translated from the, the Greek word panoplia. Panoplia. Have you ever heard of the panoply of God? They call it the panoply of God. That means the armor, the weapons of God. The complete equipment of a heavily trained, heavily armored soldier. And then he says that we are to do this to stand against the wiles of the devil. And this word wiles is from a Greek word, methodia. Methodia. Sound like anything you know of in English? The Methods. Methodology. The methodology, the plans, the schemes, the blueprint, if you please, of Satan. You see, friends, God has given to his people a blueprint. He's given to us an understanding of how to do the work, of how to resist the blueprint the methods of the devil. And he goes on to say in verse 12, the first part of verse 12, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh, sarks, and blood. Remember earlier, Paul had written that our weapons are not fleshly. And the reason that our weapons are not fleshly is because we don't war against the flesh. Well, who then do we war against? He tells us in the rest of this verse in Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And if you have a margin there, it says heavenly places. Heavenly places. In fact, it's, it's the Greek word for heavens there. Uh, and so this spiritual wickedness we can sometimes especially expect to see in what should be heavenly places. But he says we, we, we wrestle against principalities or, or rulers. The Greek word means rulers. He says we wrestle against powers, and, and that is uh, who exothea, which means the authorities, the authorities. Rulers of the darkness of this world. And this is an interesting expression uh, in the Greek that, where it speaks about the rulers here, because in, in the Greek, when you're looking at the expression Almighty, like the God Almighty. God Almighty is Pantocrantor, but this is Cosmos Krantor. It's like the, the strong one. God is the strong one of everything, but these are the strong ones of this cosmos or of this world. And he says, we're working against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We hear things happening in the professed church of God, which are just not correct. Wickedness, actually wickedness. I was relating in Sabbath school how that uh, Richard Hart, who's the president of Loma Linda University, recently wrote about Loma Linda um, observing Gay Pride Month, or this Pride Month, maybe it's more than just gay now, I mean, it's, 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 it's all kinds of craziness, and uh, how this was important for us to be Christ-like and to love everybody, you know. And uh, they make no distinction between loving the sin or the sinner. We hear things theologically. And because sometimes people use certain language, and maybe it's given by someone who is so trusted that we accept things without checking it out. Mm -hmm. Friends, we need to be faithful Bereans, studying ourselves to know what is truth or not truth. In the Sabbath school class, on the online Sabbath school class, Brother Robert from Ireland uh, put in what seemed to be a very provocative statement 
that James White had written in 1871 in the June 13th edition of the Review and Herald. And I thought, well, you know, honestly, I've been studying this stuff for 40 years. I've never seen that one yet. Does it really exist or did he just find it somewhere else that someone had fabricated or, you know, it got missed? But I went quickly to the archives, looked up the actual magazine. You can see the PDF of it. Here it is. And the, and the quotation was there. The quotation was there. It's interesting. You should look at it if you're in line. And if you're not, we can share it with you later. But these things are happening in heavenly places. And friends, yes, the people who are preaching them are wrong, but we are just as wrong when we do not thoroughly check things out for ourselves to know what is truth for us. And even though there are rulers and authorities listed here in Ephesians 12, we understand that it is Satan and his angels who are behind them all, the ones that we cannot see. And so Paul then tells us in verse 13, Wherefore take, and take is an imperative form in the Greek, there, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now that word stand in the Greek, it means to endure. To endure. You're, you're hang on. Remember Jesus said that he that endureth unto the end, what? The same shall be saved. That's right. And so we are to endure, to stand, but we need the whole armor of God. So Paul goes on to explain some of that in verse 14. He says, stand. And this stand now is in an emphatic form. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the belt of truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. I ask you a question. Can you see truth? You can't see truth. You can see the effects of truth. But, you know, how do you weigh truth? How do you form truth? Truth is a concept. It's an invisible concept. But righteousness... Can you see righteousness? You can see the effect of righteousness. You can see people act out righteousness, but you can't see righteousness as a thing. It can't be put on a scale. It can't be molded. It can't be shaped. It's something that's invisible. But friends, we need the truth. And we need the backbone to stand up and to say what the truth is. Too many preachers are just jellyfish without a backbone and won't stand up and say what is true. In Nazi Germany, you, 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 study, you study what happened in Nazi Germany. Hitler came in with a new gospel, a new leader, a new program. And in, in the late, mid to late 30s and in the early 40s, some of those ministers would be trying to preach, and here are SS men sitting on the front row, copiously taking notes. Oh, I better be careful what I say, you know. And some of those who were faithful, friends, they ended up in Bokenwag and other concentration camps and died. Many, though, no problem. They just adjusted things. Recently, the Church of England refused to define the word woman. Yeah. Here is from the New York Post. Church of England refuses to find the word woman. At least you think Church of uh, New York Post is a bad reference. They got it from Fox News. I just couldn't find the original Fox News uh, statement. But I did find it uh, here. And it says, The Church of England refused to offer up a definition of a woman, arguing that recent developments require, quote, additional care when attempting to define the word. You want to know who else picked up on the news story? The Catholic News Agency. They were quite glad to publish it. They could say, well, at least we know what a woman is. We're not afraid to say what a woman is. Isn't that something? But friends, you know, the Bible has all these answers. Let's just look at this one. In Genesis chapter 2, let's go back to Genesis, to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22. Here we find the first time that the word woman is used in the Bible. So let's find out what a woman is, according to the Bible, right? It says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a what? A woman and brought her unto the man. But the Hebrew word for man is Adam or Adam as we call it today in English. So there was Adam. Rib was taken out. A 
individual was formed, and that individual was called woman. In Genesis chapter 3, in verse 6, and when the woman, now we're getting into the fall, but there's a reason I'm using this text, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto what? Her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, who was the husband? Adam. He was the husband. He was the man. So you have a man, you had the woman. The woman is the wife of the husband. He is the husband. In Genesis 3.16, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. And that Hebrew word means pain. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be unto thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So the woman was the one that would bear the children. That makes it pretty simple to know who a woman is, doesn't it? The Bible is never not even one time, presenting a reversal of this matter. No exceptions. The man is the man. The woman is the woman. The woman is the one who brings forth the children. The woman is the companion to the man. He is the husband. She is the wife. The Bible is totally consistent on this matter. But I, I heard a statistic this last week that just boggled my mind. I hope it's not true. But they said that in a survey that one-fourth of public school children are confused today about their gender, or at least claim to question their gender. They don't know if they're male, female, or something else. Can you imagine that? All the time that I went through ed the educational process, I never even heard of such a concept. Certainly we are living, as Paul says, in perilous times in the last days. Last week, the United Nations World Health Organization, you know, called WHO, revised their gender guidelines. They are now no more simply women and men. Instead, we all live on an intersectional gender spectrum. They have, WHO has a new manual for this called the Gender Mainstreaming for Health Managers, a Practical P Approach. And on their website, on this page right here that you see, it says, highlighting and expanding on the concept of intersectionality, which looks at how gender power dynamics interact with other hierarchies of privilege or disadvantage, resulting in inequality and differential health outcomes for different people. <sighs> what a bunch of garbage that is. What a bunch of double and triple speak trying to say things. This world is so mixed up. But friends, the Bible is true. The Bible is our standard. This idea of having these gay prides and, and, and um, LGBT pride things, it used to be that if, if someone was homosexual, they were quiet about it or they didn't want anyone to know. But now they flaunt it. They flaunt it. And by doing that, they're flaunting and, and, and snubbing their nose, friends, at God, who condemns without question that lifestyle. Now, does God love those people? He loves them so much he gave his son for them. Does God want those people in his kingdom? Absolutely. If you said to me, Brother Allen, if I could bring 50 gay people in your church today, would you want them? I'd say, bring every one of them. I want them to hear the gospel. I want them to hear good news. Right? They need it. They need it. But friends, we need the truth. Amen. And we need the truth as part of the armor of God. And Jesus himself says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. And he says in Psalms 119 and verse 172, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Friends, the only way to be safe from the confusion of this world, and even the confusion of the professed church in many cases, is to be grounded in the word of God. Jesus said, in his high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 17, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Friends, I don't need who to tell me about sexuality and gender. The Bible already has. Continuing in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 15, he says, and your feet shod with the preparation or the preparedness of the gospel of peace. 
In Paul's figure, the sandals apparently serve to enable the wearer to stand firm. The purpose is so that we can stand firm, not to run. We don't run away from confrontation. We don't run away from the error. We don't run away because we are afraid of being persecuted. We are to stand. God wants you to be able to stand for the truth of the gospel, the truth that John 3.16 is real, that God really did so love the world, that he really gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This world's mental health is down the toilet today, in all honesty. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Jeremiah prophesied about it in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. Jeremiah 2, 13. He says, For my people have committed two evils. Two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of what? Living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. What they're getting is polluted at best, if they get anything. But they could have had living water for me. Now, when William Miller was writing out his uh, principles of interpretation, the last principle of interpretation he had was on faith. He said the most important thing is to have faith. Faith is so important. Well, notice what Paul says in Ephesians 6.16 about this. He says, above all, Taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We are to take the shield of faith. Now, the Roman soldier at that time, in fact, it's interesting, the word shield here, it comes right from the, 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 the Greek word for door. For door. Take your door, your shield. Because the shields were shaped like a door. They were sort of long and rectangular, about four feet high, two and a half feet wide, curved around a little bit. And that's interesting because that, that way the Roman soldiers could get in a, a row together and they could put their shields one against another and they would have basically an impenetrable field or fence that the enemy could hardly get through. And, and Paul here says that we are to take the shield of faith. Now, according to Romans chapter 10, 17, you all know the text. It says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing what? the Word of God. So, friends, if we want to build faith, if we want to inculcate faith within ourselves, we need to read what? The Word of God. The Word of God. I'll shout that. The Word of God. Amen? The Word of God. We need that. But, you know, it's not just reading the Word of God only. Because, remember, that expression hearing in the Bible, as well as even in our common vernacular times, it means to be in obedience to. You know, when we were growing up, our, our, our parents might say, now you hear me? You hear me? And we know what they meant. They meant you obey me. So faith comes by hearing, obeying, and obeying what? The Word of God. How can you obey the Word of God if you don't know it? But as we learn to obey and come into obedience to the Word of God, friends, it will help us to take the next step and then the next step. Because as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. You see, friends, we're not walking by that which is visible but rather by the invisible, by the invisible. Faith helps to see the invisible. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 27, it says, By faith, Moses, referring, it says he, but it's referring to Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, Moses did that. He endured. Remember, we are to endure. We are to stand. He says, having done all to stand, stand. That means to endure. How many of you have ever heard of George Mueller? Have you ever heard of George Mueller of Bristol, England? Yeah. Well, this is a picture of Mueller on his 90th birthday. <laughs> Tough old bird, wasn't he? Yeah. But there's a story, and some of you maybe heard the story, but I think it's well worth repeating. Uh, Mueller, uh, as I mentioned, was from Bristol, England, but he was traveling on a steamer to Quebec in Canada on a ship, and, uh, and he had a speaking appointment, but they got stopped because there was a dense fog. So so thick they couldn't go through. And Mueller went to see the captain. And he says, I've come to tell you that I must be in Quebec by Saturday afternoon. This was on a Wednesday. And, and the captain just told him, he said, well, that, that's just impossible. It's impossible. But Mueller replied, he said, well, very well. If your ship can't take me, he says, God has some other means of locomotion. 
He says, I've never broken an engagement in 57 years. And the captain said, well, I'd be willing to help you, but I'm, I'm helpless. And so Mueller suggested they go down to the chart room to pray. And uh, the captain thought to himself, what lunatic asylum could that man have come from? That was his own words. He says, I've never heard of such a thing. And he said, don't you understand how dense the fog is? And Mueller told me, he says, my eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. Now, this story was not actually told by Mueller. This story was told by the captain later. And I'm just going to share with you some of the captain's exact words that he, he chronicled on this. So the captain testified what happened next. He said, referring to Mueller, he got down on his knees and prayed one of the most simple prayers. I muttered to myself, that would suit a children's class where the children were not more than eight or nine years old. The burden of his prayer was something like this. O oh Lord, if it is consistent with thy will, please remove this fog in five minutes. You know the engagement you made for me in Quebec sat Saturday? I believe it is your will. He said, when he finished, I was going to pray, but he put his hand on my shoulder and told me not to pray. First, you do not believe he will. And second, I believe he has. And there's no need whatever for you to pray about it. I looked at him and George Mueller said, Captain, I've known my Lord for 57 years, and there's never been a single day I have failed to gain an audience with the king. Get up, Captain, and open the door, and you will find the fog is gone. I got up, and the fog was gone. The captain went on to say, you, you tell that to some people of a scientific turn of mind, and they will say that is not according to the natural law, to natural laws. No, it is according to spiritual laws. The God with whom we have to do is omnipotent. Hold on to God's omnipotence. Ask believingly. On Saturday afternoon, I may add, George Mueller was there on time. That's right. Friends, the weapons that we have are not of the flesh. We cannot see them. But they are there. They are just, they are, they are strong nevertheless. You know, I, I have a, well, I'll wait. I'll wait on that. Let's, let's go to verse 17. Verse 17. He says, and take, and that word take but it's an emphatic, it's in an emphatic form. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, we're to take the helmet of salvation. Now, I have here, come back in the picture, I have here a motorcycle helmet. And I put this on when I ride my motorcycle because it helps to keep my head safe. But, you know, it's a pretty visible thing. In fact, I chose white because it'd be e easiest to see, make me more visible, right? But when you have on the helmet of salvation, again, is that something you can see? You can't see that. But we're to put on the whole armor of God. Now, I also have here, while we're at it, I have here a jacket. It just looks like a nice jacket, doesn't it? But inside this jacket, what do you think is inside this jacket? Armor. There's actually body armor inside this jacket at various strategic points. So that if you, hopefully never, God forbid, do spill out or get hit. You have a little bit of protection that hopefully helps you. You can't see the armor, you know, but it's there. God has given us weapons. You, you know, you, you could have, I suppose, if you were the captain, you heard George Mueller's prayer. You can't see a prayer. This verse tells us to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The helmet of salvation and the one great offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit or the Word of God. Today, so many do not even know what they are saved from. We talk about the helmet of salvation. Salvation comes from that Greek word sortiria for salvation, or, and it goes back to the word for Savior. But what are we saved from? People don't even know what sin is. Ask them, you know, what is sin? They don't know what sin is. Sin is subjective. Sin is what you think it is. Salvation is what you think it is then. But we have a true Savior who saves us from sin, and we are put on the helmet. The helmet protects the most vital part of your body, the head, the head. The definition of sin is so marred and murky to many today, and you know what? It's, being, it's been made that way because, unfortunately, at least in part, a lot of preachers have made this a murky situation. 
I was talking with someone this week and, and, and we were talking about this concept of original sin mm -hmm. and this redefinition of sin. And he said, you know, he said, I was reading from some, some things that you had written and I was looking at the systematic theology that Norman Golly from Southern had, had written. And he says, they're, they're teaching a different definition of sin. They're teaching original sin. He said, I didn't, he said, I knew that was happening in the One True God movement. He said, I didn't know the mainline church was doing it. I said, they've been doing it a long time, brother. A long time, long before we got the idea. But notice what God says about this. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I, I had a picture about, I just couldn't show it to you. It was so bad. But it was two officials from the United States government that were recently in France for the commemoration of Bastille Day. And, one, and they were both transgender. There's a man who, uh, who, who became a transgender woman and, and a man who became a transgender or uh, whatever, however you figure it out. And it was just, it was, it was so gross looking. And they are representing the United States of America there. Can you imagine what some of those people think of us? Now, the Bible says, woe to them that call evil good. And so I today say, woe unto you, Joe Biden, and all those people who are promoting and allowing these kind of things to happen. Now, the Bible says to pray for those who are in, in authority. And so we pray for our president. We pray for President Biden. He needs our prayers, friends. But what about those people in, in Nazi Germany? Were they not to stand up and say what, what Herr Hitler is saying is wrong? Were they to be quiet? Having done all things to stand, stand. Stand. Take a stand. Don't be afraid to say the truth. Remember, even Jesus called Herod a fox. And we must be honest. I don't want to be like some of those pastors that we mentioned earlier in Nazi Germany in the late 30s and 40s who refused to speak we are emphatically told to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But friends, you can't do that if you don't know it. If you don't have it infused into your life, if it has not become, as James says, the engrafted Word in your life, you will be an easy prey for the enemy. It's only through knowing the Bible that we know the truth. And if we, if we can gain an audience, as George Mueller said, I've gained an audience with the God of heaven for the last 57 years or whatever it was, if we will gain an audience with the God of heaven, friends, we can stand firm. Paul says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Watch ye saints with eyelids waking. <laughs> Lo, the powers of heaven are indeed shaking. Watch with the eye of faith because, friends, you can't watch with just your physical eyes. They don't tell you very much because you're fighting against invisible forces. Be strong in the true gospel. Realize that God is working in you and will help you. Accept his armor and you will be able to overcome the plans and the methods, the blueprint, if you please, of the devil. But only as you take the armor of faith. Friends, I don't know if you've ever really thought about this. You know, maybe you've just read these verses, think that's nice, that's part of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. But this is very practical workings of the gospel here, that we are to incorporate these things into our lives so that we can overcome Satan on every point. Excuse me. <coughs> in warfare, in warfare, sometimes the generals, they say, well, you know, I have to choose my battles. I have to choose my battles. And they don't expect to win every battle. I was watching a documentary this week on some of the fighting in World War II, and there was a particular point uh, during the Battle of the Bulge that the Allies were trying to capture. And the people who were at point, <laughs> they were radioing back saying, you know, this is suicide. And you know what the commander said? You stay there. You stay there. And the idea is, we're probably going to lose most, maybe all of you. But it will help us in the overall plan of winning the war. But friends, the good news is God doesn't work like that. 
God doesn't plan to concede a battle here, to concede a battle there, so they can win the bigger war. God doesn't concede a single battle because every battle can be fought and won by putting on the whole armor of God. And so I encourage you today to put on the whole armor of God. And may God bless you lots and lots and lots.